Welcome everyone, I'm Dana Cunningham, Dean of the Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts University. Today, I'm really excited to virtually welcome you to a Tisch College's final Civic Life Lunch event of the fall semester. It's on extreme weather, climate change, and the fight for environmental change with renowned environmentalist, Doug Foy. It's a privilege for me to welcome Doug to Tufts today, not only because he's a friend, but also because his, of his dedication to protecting our planet and to working to mitigate the effects of climate change, which have been and continue to be the hallmark of his impressive career. Doug is a founder and CEO of the Serifix Corporation, a strategic consulting firm and business incubator focused on energy, the environment, transportation, and climate change. Prior to launching Serifix in 2006, he served as the first Secretary of Commonwealth Development in the administration of Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney, a unique role where he oversaw the agendas of transportation, housing, environment, and energy. For 25 years before his government service, Doug was the president and CEO of the Conservation Law Foundation, New England's premier environmental advocacy organization. His leadership on environmental issues was, has been honored with many accolades, including the President's Environmental and Conservation Challenge Award, the nation's highest conservation award, the Woodrow Wilson Award from Princeton University, and the Order of the British Empire from the Queen of England. Another cool fact about Doug, he was a member of the 1968 US Olympic rowing team and the 1969 US national rowing team. Joining Doug in conversation is Tina Woolston, the Director of the Office of Sustainability at Tufts. Since being named to her role in 2010, Tina has worked tirelessly with senior administrators and departments across Tufts to develop and support the university's sustainability goals and efforts, ranging from transportation to carbon neutrality planning, sustainable living communities, and new student and employee orientations. During her tenure, Tina has created a wealth of innovative programming, including peer-to-peer -peer and general education programs for students and employees, the Green Fund for on-campus community-led projects, and courses focused on action for sustainability. She also facilitated President Monaco's University-wide Sustainability Council that developed goals and recommendations in the areas of water, waste, energy, and emissions. Tina has invested considerably in this critical work by expanding the sustainability office and by creating a robust student internship program that works on recycling education and outreach, composting, co-curricular education, sustainability communications, and tracks Tufts progress towards sustainability and carbon neutrality. Before her time at Tufts, Tina directed the sustainability program at the Earthwatch Institute and co-founded her town's Climate Action Committee. She was also one of the first 1,000 people to be trained by former Vice President Al Gore as part of the Climate Reality Project. Today's conversation is both timely and critical. As we speak, there are two days left of the COP26 Climate Summit currently underway in Glasgow, and the world is watching with bated breath what many view as the world's last best chance to get climate change under control. Thank you to our guests for joining and sharing your valuable insights with us. And thank you to our co-sponsors, the Office of Sustainability and the Environmental Studies Program for, all, for their partnership. I'm looking forward to this important discussion. Please welcome Doug Foy and Tina Wilston. Hi, Doug. I'm so pleased to be able to talk to you today. I've been learning a lot about your background and I'm very excited um, to hear all about what you've done and where you think we should be going. And, and I will ask you some questions about um, the COP20, uh, the COP in Glasgow right now. But first, I wanted to start with uh, some questions that 
um, we're close to my uh, heart, which is I teach a class called Sustainability in Action, where students learn about all the different facets of sustainability, but also all the different ways they can incorporate climate change work into their career. So over the course of your career, you've been involved with all four major sectors working to combat climate change, advocacy groups, government, private enterprise, and academia. From your perspective and experience, what do you think the role of each one is in fighting climate change? And is there one sector where you feel like a person can make the biggest impact? Well, great question. Um, and by the way, congratulations, Tina, for all that you're already doing at Tufts. Uh, it's quite a list. And so you're already headed down exactly the kind of path of practical solutions that seem to me to be critical. Um, yes, I was. I have been involved in all four sectors. I think they all play a critical role. Um, the advocacy world and the academic world uh, sort of brought the whole set of issues that climate change raises to our collective attention uh, decades ago. Um, and it's evolved since then to where it's now an international challenge and everyone is quite aware of it, of the risks. Um, I think that those roles, both academia and the advocacy roles, will continue and be critically important. I think they were especially important in the earliest days when there really wasn't even recognition of this problem. Um, government will always have a role. Government sets the boundaries, uh, conditions, sets the rules, sets the rules of engagement, um, creates the market mechanisms that um, we will need. Uh, so government at all levels, uh, local, state, regional, federal, international, will um, be important. But I, I actually have gotten to the point now that I think private enterprise is ultimately the only way we're going to crack the code on climate change. It is the place where solutions will have to be built. Um, enterprises have to scale and be able to create answers to the climate uh, challenges that are both economically um, uh, attractive, um, environmentally successful, and respect the communities in which they're, they're lodged. So, uh, Ultimately, I think the only way we get to the scale of solutions that are needed for climate change, uh, uh, we will need um, the world of corporate activity to become a major player. And they already are in many, many ways. We can talk about that. Um, but ultimately, I'm a big believer that we have to come up with solutions that make um, great success and great stories uh, for everyone that's involved and are also profitable. Um, so if I had to answer where I think your, your students can get their best shot, um, I would say any of the four are absolutely relevant. My guess is that the, the number of available jobs and opportunities are going to explode in the private sector over the next 20 years. And that will be where the real growth opportunities are going to be lodged. That's a, yeah, I, I totally can understand that. Um, as another little nugget that I want to learn from my students, do you feel like there's particular qualities that you think would make a person particularly suited for like one sector over the other? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> um, well, I, my my history is I majored in physics in college, engineering and physics, and then I went off to Cambridge and, and studied geophysics, and then I realized I was way too argumentative to be a scientist, and I needed to be, I, so I ended up in law school. And um, I actually think that the, the 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 qualities, as you put it, the personal strengths or talents um, that are needed. It's an all hands on deck challenge. I think people that are really good just as people, people uh, folks that can communicate well, that can reach audiences, that can persuade folks to change their ways are going to be critically important. Scientists, obviously, um, technology is going to be a critical part of the solution. Um, good business instincts, good innovation instincts, um, entrepreneurial behavior. I mean, it's all going to be part of the answer. Um, so I, I wouldn't carve, I, I, if somebody's in chemistry right now, bravo, be a chemist. Um, if somebody's in the humanities and uh, is mastering the art of writing or journalism, um, uh, uh, communications, we're going to need that continuously for as long as this challenge is in front of us. Um, and that's, that's what I, it's in, I'm glad that you mentioned that about industry, because that's 
um, in my class, you know, there's people from all different backgrounds because that's the concept is that you can be in any industry and make a difference, whether it's being an artist, you know, reaching people that way or something else. But the folks that are interested in, in finance tend to be interested in investment banking. And I don't get very many people that are interested in like building a company or running a company. So I think that's going to be a great place for me to like reach out to and, and, and you know, find students. And Although we can get, yeah. yeah, well, yeah, we, we also need to capture those investment bankers, by the way. Um, the, I, one of the things that came out of Glasgow, or at least tentatively it's come out of Glasgow, is a, a commitment from a whole pile of banks to stop funding coal-fired power plants worldwide. Um, it, 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 the, the big investment banks that are the source of a lot of the capital that is going into building stuff um, need to be on board on this. So the investment bankers have a role to play. The people running the companies, though, that are actually doing the engineering, doing the solution finding and building are going to be critically important. Um, I, one of my favorite uh, pieces of information recently is that a friend of mine ran the nuclear engineering department, headed the chairman of the nuclear engineering department at MIT for many years. And now he's a more, even more senior person at MIT. And he said that 20 or 30 years ago, every student that showed up at MIT to study nuclear engineering was planning to get involved in submarines or GE light water reactors or whatever the traditional nuclear stuff. He says 100% of the students that show up for nuclear engineering now are showing up because of climate change. And oh, they wow. want to figure out what they can do. And are there solutions in the nuclear world that can actually help solve the problem? Um, <clears throat> I think that's going to be true in many, many different disciplines within academia. Uh, the students are gonna be coming, bringing their special talents, but focused on what can I do to move the needle on climate change? Yeah, yeah, and there's so many different ways they can do it. Um, so sort of following up on that, uh, one of the challenges with climate change is, is that it touches so many different areas. In your role in Governor Romney's administration, you are tasked with overseeing transportation, housing, environment, and energy, which was kind of a you know, new concept to have one person look at all of those. Um, did that impact your ability to make strategic changes in the, how the state approached climate change? Um, and if you know, is there another way you would organize government if you had the chance to do it now? <laughs> well, oh, there are all kinds of things I might want to do with government if I was doing it again. But um, it was a, the whole idea behind that, uh, and it was Governor Romney's idea, really, um, was to break the silos that were dividing those agencies, because the agencies were ending up in conflict with each other frequently. Um, uh, the transportation agency would be trying to tear down trees along roadsides in, in village centers, and the environmental agency was trying to stop them. Um, or they'd be building something into a wetland and the environmental agency was trying to stop them. And they literally were fighting with each other, often in lawsuits that my organization was filing against the transportation agency. Um, and the environmental agency would join our side of the case. It was sort of a crazy way to run a railroad. And, um, and so the idea was, let's see if we can get more strategic alignment uh, amongst the agencies. And that, I think we did quite well, uh, given the time we had and the, and the, and the size of the challenge. I mean, the best example of this, by the way, was happened on my, like my fourth day in office. We had, I had my own cabinet, uh, the secretaries that ran those agencies. And so we sat down for a cabinet meeting and the, the person that was heading the housing agency who had been doing this for 20 or 30 years and wonderful leader of the housing agency introduced herself to the person who was heading the MBTA, the transit agency, they had never met. Oh, wow. And, and in, in their 20 or 30 years of government. And when you think about it, housing, transportation, the, the nexus between accessibility um, and uh, household costs, I mean, transportation is the second highest cost of, of an average household, second only to the cost of the home itself. Um, and so where you locate housing has a huge impact on its affordability. And here you had a transit agency and a housing agency that literally weren't talking to each other. Um, so we fixed that. And there's a lot of other opportunities to do that throughout government. Um, I think you're seeing that happen some now in the Biden administration. You have um, Gina McCarthy, who uh, worked with me. She was in my administration in state, in Commonwealth, Massachusetts. Uh, she's now one of Biden's top officials in climate change. And she is looking at 
all the agency activities. Um, so you're you're seeing it happen even at the federal level now. And is there anything like, would, are there any other, like how would you arrange it? Would you keep those four together? Would you add other groups or would you do anything different like going back? Um, well, I probably would keep the four together. The, the, the concept behind those four were that they were the, they were the large capital spenders uh, that they spent a lot of money on parks, on forests, on roads, on bridges, on transit, on housing, um, not so much on energy. Uh, but it, so there was a large capital flow that, that ran through it, $5 billion plus a year. Um, and the notion was, let's get that strategic. Let's, the, the governor's idea, because he came out of the private sector from Bain Capital, was let's make that, those investment decisions more sensibly. Right. Um, and that, that I think where, where you get the most leverage in many of the things that the government can do is where it chooses to spend its money. Um, yeah. And for instance, the, the Commonwealth was actively supporting the construction of schools in farm fields outside of town centers because they could have playing fields that didn't cost them too much money. And so it forced every child to be bused to the school. You couldn't walk to school anymore. You couldn't drive, uh, ride your bike to school. We tried to reverse that. Um, we said, okay, we'll help pay for more expensive playing fields in town. We want the kids to be able to walk to school. Um, and uh, it, 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 those kinds of uh, economic incentives are very powerful tools for government to use. Oh yeah, I, I feel like you can you can see this happening where you can create a law, but if the law is defunded, then it's essentially like you didn't create the law. Right. Um, right. Or you can fund something without creating a law, and it can have a huge impact. Like just looking at the subsidies for you know wind and solar, and how what the development that that's incentivized. Right. Or things like zoning. I mean, the local communities have enormous control over land use decisions and zoning is the critical tool for that. Um, and for in a, in a state that is wrestling with affordable housing challenges, um, being able to build more compact housing, build multifamily housing, um, cross generational housing, um, a lot of the zoning in, in cities and towns in Massachusetts forbid it. It was illegal. Yeah. Um, I, 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 Concord, where my daughter and grandchildren live, um, uh, Concord is one of the great paradigmatic towns in the country. Um, it's a classic town center, town, uh, village green, churches, shops, housing. You couldn't build Concord in Concord today, given its zoning ordinances. Um, it yeah. would be illegal. It's two acre minimum zoning, one acre minimum zoning. You couldn't build a town center in Concord. It so yeah. happens that it was built 200 years ago. So, um, and so the zoning becomes a critical tool. We worked hard on that to in incentivize better, more creative zoning solutions, which by the way, are huge climate change benefits. The more people can walk, the more people can be um, in communities where everything is within a quarter mile or half a mile. I and mean, my test of a really great community is, can I walk to get a quart of milk? Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, that no, is a I, funda fundamental climate change goal. Well, and also if you, the, you know, if you have more than one unit in a building, just the, you know, the, the surface to uh, area ratio means that it's gonna be a more efficient building. Um, we have a, exactly. a little irony here where we have a, a sustainable living community um, that actually is currently in a suite in a big, you know, residence hall and they, they want their own house. And our planning department was like, actually, it's more sustainable for you to be in a big apartment complex um, right. than in your own wood frame house. So, Well, for years, the, the data is, and I think it's still true, I haven't looked at it recently, but for years, um, it turned out that New York City was one of the most energy efficient places in the country and in the world, yeah. in, in large part because it was so concentrated, but also because it was uh, had transit. People walked, people biked. Um, they were also seven pounds lighter than the average Westchester County citizen because they just got more exercise. Um, okay. And so, yeah, there's no doubt that buildings... Buildings are a huge part of the climate change problem, heating and cooling buildings. And so the more we can design buildings to deal with that problem, in part by making them more compact or more concentrated, the better. Yeah, and I think 
I'm glad you brought up the zoning thing. I grew up in Bolton, which is right down the street from sure. Concord. Also has like a two acre minimum. We were in the downtown, which had no stores. Um, but <laughs> I think people people always, you know, especially students at, at, at Tufts, they want to make a big difference. They want to go to COP26 or they want to work in the federal government. But, but zoning is, especially in a town, you know, a city has a governor, but a town, you can be a citizen on a zoning board and make a huge difference way, way easier or way more easily um, than you could trying to get a job in the big, you know, federal administration. Do, do you agree? I agree completely. And in fact, I think ultimately the solutions to climate change are going to are going to be born in cities and towns and states and then regions and then ultimately in countries. Um, virtually all the great innovation around environmental performance um, has started in cities and towns um, and then in states and then in regions. And uh, yes, there are opportunities. I mean, you can sit on your uh, local planning board, you can sit on your um, zoning board, you can sit on the local energy board. Some towns like Concord have their own energy company. Um, you can create a walking school bus for years that people were worried, well, I don't want my kid to walk to school because it's a little right. bit, Alone. makes me uneasy. So yeah. they created walking school buses where parents would go out and just walk a whole crop of kids to school. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's a wonderful idea. Um, and uh, so, yes, there, I, I, my stump speech when I was in government um, was cities are the answer. What was the question? Right. <laughs> That's um, and the reality is that cities um, and towns, um, but are the best example we have of energy efficiency, the best example we have of equitable transportation and transportation access, the best way often to care for seniors because the community is surrounds them, um, right. the best way to deal with uh, health because people walk more and are, are, are healthier because of it. The best way to deal with parks, because you can provide parks. And we did the Boston Harbor case to clean up Boston Harbor. The goal of that case was to allow the graduating class of the high school 2000 class to be able to swim in their own water. That's amazing. Um, yeah. The, it, because these were kids that weren't going to Cape Cod in the summer for vacation. They, if they couldn't swim in Pleasure Bay in South Boston, they couldn't swim. They had to go to a pool or open a fire hydrant. Um, that was their water, and they were entitled to have it be clean and safe. Um, the, but as a consequence, you go down there now, uh, during COVID, uh, it was overwhelmed with people. It was so close. And those are incredibly important resources. And again, people can be part of that. You can be part of that part. Um, that effort in a city like Boston. You guys are, I mean, Somerville uh, has done wonderful stuff. Oh, Medf yeah. Medford, I mean, the mayor of Somerville is one of the best mayors ever, uh, in my view. And um, you're getting a green line coming out to you guys. Um, right there, uh, right got, on campus. Uh, yeah, hello, I pulled the trigger on that when I was in government. And I, the mayor, yeah. the mayor of Somerville came in, sat down in my office, I'd never met him, Joe Curtitoni, sat down. Um, I was in office maybe three months and he said, I'm the mayor of Somerville. It's the densest populated city in New England. Whatever, 70,000 people in what, two square miles, three square miles. We have four transit lines running through our community, two commuter rail lines and two transit lines. And we have one stop at Sullivan Square and that's inequitable and you need to fix it. What a line. Yeah. And yeah. that's where the green line came from. Um, and the Assembly Square station on the Orange Line, um, giving Somerville now, what, six, seven transit stations by the time it's done, including one at your front door. Yeah, and, um, and, and it, it actually really stimulated, you know, a discussion within Tufts around that corner. Tufts owns a lot of property around the corner where it is and, and discussion around mixed use development and how do you make it walkable? It's not a great intersection. Um, right. so, Thank you. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was Joe's uh, idea more than anyone, but it was an example of where government can really do smart things with where it spends its money. Yeah. Um, and uh, that Green Line extension will transform 
the whole corridor over the next 20 to 50 years um, in all kinds of ways that I think will be beneficial and all kinds of ways that will have climate benefits. Yeah, uh, well, when I went to high school, Davis Square didn't have the red line and right. we always went to Harvard Square, but now Davis right. Square is, it's like the perfect example of that. Um, yeah, somebody asked whether we can get the green line extended to Route 16. That was the original plan, was it not? That was the original plan. And by the way, the original plan for the red line was to extend it to Route 128. Oh. And um, Lexington fought it. Yeah. And that's why we have a bike path there instead of a transit line. Uh, it's a great bike path, the Minuteman yeah. bike path. But that was a train corridor. Lexington wanted it close and then didn't want um, the red line to be extended why i will never understand and so the red line stops at alewife yeah well it, it didn't, didn't there's need a hope to that it'll, it'll get to 16 and that's why the station that we have is not a terminal station it's not like right. Ilwaf. it's like a it's a transitory station so there's still right. hope for correct right. correct but i'm glad we're talking about these local things because again put in the in the context of climate change generally this is where the most important action is going to happen for decades is going to be these kinds of local decisions, whether they're transit decisions or housing decisions, development decisions, um, resiliency decisions. I mean, how does the city of Boston or the city of New York or Miami or wherever deal with flooding risks? Um, how do we deal with heat um, uh, crises, uh, uh, super hot days? Um, those decisions, those solutions are going to be crafted in communities and then they will that will be the innovation that will build large national momentum and from a small town i i do see that um the state government is really important because they can help distribute resources to the small towns that don't have money because that i think that's the challenge with a small town is that you know it could know that it needs to be more climate resilience and needs to but it if it doesn't have the money then it can be really difficult for them to act. So did you get a sense for that? Do you think that's true? It is true. And uh, we, uh, when I was in government, we tried to deal with it by sending them resources and technical support and whatever. Um, but yes, it's, uh, again, this is why I'm a huge fan of um, government piracy, uh, where you steal everybody else's best ideas. Um, there, there's a, such an enormous amount of innovation going on in communities that, one of the things you can do is just look around and see, yeah. well, who's really doing a really good job with this? Let's take that idea. Um, and uh, the, I think the mayor of Los Angeles said something to the effect the other day when he was in Glasgow that um, good mayors borrow good ideas, great mayors steal good ideas. Um, <laughs> and, and something like that. He'll maybe express it a little bit better, but I think that that's right. The thing that's interesting about mayors and governors for that matter, and somewhat distinct from the president or senator or whatever, um, they actually have operational responsibility, not only policy responsibility, but it, it's really important that yeah. the trains run on time. It's really important yeah. that the park, the litter is picked up on the park. It's really important that you have a plan to deal with the floods that are going to hit the seaport district in Boston. And so mayors have policy and operational responsibility, which means they are the folks that will have to build executable solutions on climate change. They are the folks that are going to figure out how to solve these problems. And then, and then states are going to follow that model that their cities build. And so your little town of Bolton um, can steal a bunch of good ideas from Concord. Concord can yeah. steal them from, you know, Wellesley. Wellesley can steal them from Boston. And before you know it, you got a whole, <laughs> you got a whole state doing it, and then you got a whole region doing it. Which is the but, way energy has evolved in New England, by the way. Energy oh, strategies. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Um, what do you mean by that? Well, I think uh, energy, because it's the source of all the climate uh, challenges we have, is either deforestation or. Um, uh, and methane emissions or energy combustion. Um, uh, energy strategy and performance is typically at a, at a regional scale, um, both nationally here in the US and internationally. That's grids only go so far and they're interconnected, but the core is, and New England, for instance, has its own grid. It's plugged into New York, but it's the New England 
power pool the New England grid. Um, so the six states in New England have to get their act together in order to solve some of the energy challenges they face, including cleaning up the grid. Um, and that uh, activity started, uh, you know, back in the old days, they built a lot of coal-fired power plants, they built some nukes. Um, and in the late 80s, a bunch of us started to lean on the utility company saying, you're going to have to stop doing this. I mean, you need to use energy efficiency as a resource. It's much more powerful than new power plants and much cheaper and blah, blah, blah. And uh, there were big battles. We fought battles for years and then ended up negotiating deals with the big utility companies where they did treat energy efficiency as an investment. We changed the regulatory world so that they were rewarded for doing that. Remember, a utility company has no incentive to sell less of its product unless somehow it gets paid for selling less of its product. It's like asking you know, a donut manufacturer to sell fewer donuts. No, no I'm not doing that. Um, so the utility companies had an incentive to keep selling electricity as much as they could. Uh, they lost money when they did energy efficiency. So we changed the regs, um, first in Massachusetts and then throughout New England. Um, and utility companies now spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars a year on energy efficiency to make their customers' buildings more efficient, help them put in better lighting systems, better fridges, um, better air conditioners. Um, that was a business structure change that happened first in a state, then in a region, and is now a national policy. Um, right. Yeah. And that's the way these things tend to happen. The same thing happened with appliance efficiency standards. A couple states, New York, California, Massachusetts, started to beat on the guys making microwave ovens and refrigerators. Refrigerators used to be the biggest energy user in, this, in the house, yeah. 200, 300 watt device. They now use about as much electricity as a 60 watt light bulb. Um, be, and But the fridge manufacturers resisted it until a bunch of states said, we're going to make you do this. And, and by the time the New England states and New York and California had issued orders, then they all said, oh, well, gee, we better have a national standard because <laughs> we're going to have to do this anyway. Um, and then you ended up with national appliance efficiency standards. So, well, and that's happening with the automobile industry. Exactly. Well. You know, because exactly. no automobile maker wants to have to make a special car for California. <laughs> That's right. You know? That's right. And the states have banded together with California. So there's some, I forget the California state clutch, but there's some 15 or 20 of us, including Massachusetts and New York, that, have, that are part of the California standards and uh, the prior presidential administration, or the Trump administration tried to undermine that. Um, and it's now been reinforced and, and is still the law of the land. Um, so yeah, the states are going to be pushing the vehicle manufacturers. Some of them are all getting on board now. Yeah, we're going to go electric. Yes, we're going to do that by 2030, 2035. Uh, the states can purchase, can demand it as purchasing requirements. Um, uh, and I think that that will be pretty significant. By the way, as we move transportation into electric, the electric grid is going to have to probably get twice as big, which is its own really big challenge because it has to not only get clean, but it has to get twice as large because it's going to now be doing cars and potentially buildings because we're going to try to electrify a lot of the stuff in buildings. To but again, the grid has to be clean for us to safely electrify everything and it's going to have to be a lot bigger and it has to be um you have to pull the energy the energy from different places in the country you know that don't normally have huge transmission lines so you have to build new transmission lines and um yeah yeah and talk about it not in my backyard problem um, uh -huh. and uh and yes, I think that one of the, actually one of the really interesting challenges for the environmental community right now is transmission lines will be essential to a renewable energy future. They are essential and we'll need more of them because we are going to have distri dispersed distributed generation. It's going to have to move across boundaries. Um, you're going to need uh, firm power. I mean, renewable solar wind um, have huge benefits. Obviously, they become very cost competitive. Um, but they still are episodic, both yeah. daily and seasonally. Um, yeah. So there will need to be what's known as firm power, baseload power, whether it's, and it has to be clean. So it's going to be, it may have to be nuclear. It is nuclear right now. Um, it's going to have to be things like hydro. 
and hydro raises its own issues. And you're going to need transmission to get from one place to another. I mean, New England is blessed with sitting next to the largest battery in the world, which happens to be Hydro Quebec. Yeah. Yeah. But getting the power down from Hydro Quebec into New York, into New England is a continuing battle because you've got to build transmission lines to do it. So Tufts is getting our first gigantic battery, by the way. I don't think mm. it's, you're one of the first to know. <laughs> okay. But we have some solar on our roofs in our athletic district, and we're getting a battery that is a collaboration with the utility program that you were mentioning before, which is now called the SMART program. Yeah. Which, for those of you on the call, it's your own money <laughs> that your, the utilities are giving back to you because they be right. on your <laughs> right. on your bill. Well, um, that's. I mean, I'm glad to hear it. I mean, battery storage is going to be a huge part of the future. Uh, yeah. the, it's going to be one of the ways you deal with the variability of renewable sources is you're going to have battery capacity, and, and it's going to have to be at scale. Um, one of the things that's interesting about electric vehicles, uh, the Tesla is a rolling big battery, yeah. Yeah. which can run your house if your power goes off. Um, it can be plugged into the grid um, during the day when you're not driving it. I and mean, the thing that's interesting about automobiles is that they spend 95% of their time parked. Yeah. Um, and so if you have an electric vehicle that actually is a battery that either needs to be charged or can discharge into supporting a grid, all of a sudden you have a very interesting mobile fleet of battery capacity. And that's going to be a, a not just vehicles, but large scale battery installations are going to be a very important part of the future for renewables to succeed. And did you see the ad during the, uh, I thought it was the Super Bowl. There was an ad with a, that showed a pickup truck, a battery powered pickup truck, truck powering a farmhouse. And I was, I thought that was a very clever way to, yeah. to show the value of some of an, a green thing without showing it as being green. Like the value isn't to the planet. The value is, you know, to your family and taking care of your family. Well, and in fact, that's always going to have to be the fundamental message. This is better in all kinds of ways, economically, uh, in terms of functionality. And that's, a, I think that was a, I think that was the Ford F-150 that they're yeah. going to have be fully electric. It also goes zero to 60 in like four seconds. So all the people that have a lead foot, they're going to be really happy. I mean, yeah. Ford, to their credit, has um, they first they were the first to go to aluminum frames, and they got you know people were beating them up. Oh, I want steel! I want steel! And they said, no, 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 this is lighter. It's just as strong. We make military vehicles out of these things, of course, where you make a pickup truck. And now they're going to go electric. I actually <laughs> I've resisted having a pickup truck because they're so inefficient. But when they come out with that one, I think that that might be my truck. So. Yeah. Um, uh, and you're right. They, they, those are the, the message. I, I flew out yesterday on a Delta flight and um, they had an ad running on the screen in the seat when they were opening it up um, talking about air, air travel and how they are going to be carbon neutral by 2035, I think. How they do that's going to be interesting. Um, but they were basically talking about how we want you to be able to go to all the places you want to go and explore the world, but we want you to not destroy the world while you're doing it. Um, and we're going to help fix that problem. And th that has to be the message always. It's not just, this is a religious exercise. We need to solve right. climate change. This is a fundamental matter of our well-being as a nation, as a, as a world. Um, and what we found on energy efficiency, for instance, is we decoupled energy growth from GDP growth. Yeah. So we no longer needed to keep growing and building more and more power plants. We could be vastly more efficient. And that's going to be true for a lot of these solutions, including well, the pickup truck. I'm glad to hear that because at Tufts, um, I'm counting it up, 10%, 10% of our emissions come from flights that are that are paid for by Tufts that we can count. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh. Wow, that's oh, I like that piece of data. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. Okay. And the more, well, yeah, the more efficient we get with our buildings, with our electricity usage, the greater that percentage is becomes of our um, footprint. And so, 
Um, what did you find uh, during the pandemic? I mean, the Zooming has been oh, yeah. a help. And yeah. I assume that everyone, one of the things you see happening is that everybody, all the businesses are now reassessing how much business travel do we need as opposed to what we can do Zooming. Um, I assume that'll change things somewhat, but you're still going to have a lot of international air travel. And, uh, well, it goes back a little bit to what you were saying about incentives and perverse incentives. And so if there's an incentive for faculty to go and present at conferences all over the world in order to get tenure, Hmm. Then they're going to go and present at conferences all over the world. Not all faculty want to do that, you know, and so so they're so it is it's a really good conversation. And I really like the way in our discussion we're tying together the sort of, you know, you need so you need change at a higher level, which could be, you know, policies within a university or policies within a you know a nation or a state, but you also need, you know, action at the yeah. Like the action, the ideas for the action come from, you know, the people who are doing the work, but then you need supporting policies. Exactly, exactly. Um, but again, I mean, you know, we were, we mentioned briefly the, uh, the COP26 uh, shending going on in Glasgow, which is important and treaties are important, but the, and treaties on climate change are really important uh, just to make sure everyone is aware of the fact that this is huge risk, um, but they're not self-executing. They don't, they don't do the work. Uh, they simply say, we need to fix this um, and we'll try. Uh, and it, it looks like Glasgow is not going to do much better than that. Um, uh, it, it'll sort of be a second version of Paris saying we pledge to do better. We already need to do better. But the doing better is going to fall to all the communities you and I are talking about, um, uh, towns, cities, state, regions, and then so nations. I I know we have to wrap up soon, but I want to ask, I want to end with a really deep question or big question, <laughs> which is, so we talked about power lines needing to, you know, be built. We talked about, you know, changes needing to happen at the local level, new types of power to be built and where do you put it? And so, you know, Tufts has, a, has pledged and is working really hard to be an anti-racist institution. Um, and there's, I've been reading articles about how, I'm going down a little path here, I hope it's okay. But you know, when you choose where to cite something, you have to, you make a decision. Um, and oftentimes the decision makes, puts a value judgment on which people um, matter more than, than other people. And so this is yeah. why, the power plants and landfills often in black neighborhoods or other low income neighborhoods because they don't have the resources to fight it and there's uh yeah so there there's basically right. a, a judgment call there so what what can we do as a as individuals as states as the country to help make it more equitable to help make sure that those power lines are not going to destroy you know native uh lands or you know, cut through lower income neighborhoods? Well, I, I, it, it's an incredibly important question. And it is true that, uh, that a lot of the industrial facilities that we build, including power plants, have been citing, cited in communities who were least able to protect themselves or defend themselves. Um, and that obviously has been a major source of controversy and battles over the years. I mean, coal-fired power plants, Cancer Alley down the, in the Gulf states, um, where you've got all these industrial facilities contaminating the surrounding countryside. Um, one of the advantages, one of the great boons of a more dispersed, distributed, renewable, and efficient energy system is you're going to have fewer of these big plants that you have to put somewhere. Uh, we, we know already how to save 40% of the energy we're currently using in efficient, cost-effective ways, 40%. Um, we don't have to build a single new power plant to accomplish that. What we have to do is go into communities that have dilapidated housing, have inefficient furnaces, and help those communities fix those facilities. That's an enormously interesting investment in the very communities that you're concerned about. Um, that's where the opportunity to mine not only energy benefits and climate benefits, but community benefits. Think of all the jobs fixing those buildings. Yeah. Think of all the, the, the 
skilled workforce that needs to be doing energy efficiency in buildings all over the world. And we don't have to build a single new power plant to make that power plant um, a huge success. And that's been something that a whole bunch of us have been working on for 30 or 40 years, but we're still only scratching the surface. 40% of the energy we're currently using is wasted and could be economically safe through yeah. those jobs. So my first answer to your question is, I don't want to build any new power plants if I can afford it. That's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I want to shut down the dirty ones, replace them with some clean stuff that's in appropriate locations, often smaller, yeah. um, rather than you know big industrial scale operations. But I mostly want to see us um, fix the buildings, the, the, the vehicles, the transportation systems um, that we already have. I think that's yeah, that's really great. Thank you. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna thank you for taking all my questions <laughs> right now, and then I'll let you take some other questions. We have our first um, questioner on the screen, Catherine. So, if Catherine, you wanna um, put on your camera and ask a question. Hi. Um, thanks. It's been a great discussion. I am a, a Tufts grad, class of 1980. I'm an English major. And I've just uh, joined forces with a couple of other jumbos to start a, I guess, a climate action newsletter, which is called The Climate Capitalist. And we are very interested in supercharging investment in this transition to clean energy. My question, you kind of answered it about California has been a real leader in EVs and other areas. And Hawaii, too, has done an amazing job in their clean energy transformation. How do right. we scale success, especially when our country is so politically divided? Well, great question. Um, I, and by the way, I think that focusing on the investment uh, world, this whole movement on ESG um, uh, is critically important. There's a huge amount of capital now chasing after ESG quality companies, which is gonna be really important. Um, I'm involved with uh, several companies that um, are deep into this, including work in Hawaii, work in California. Um, I think the scale the scaling is going to come from the private sector uh, building the business models that are incredibly profitable, doing the right thing. That's where scale happens. Mm -hmm. um, you you need a state like California or Massachusetts. I mean, Massachusetts has done a, a really quite a, an impressive job on climate so far. We still have a long way to go. Um, but there's been a lot of policy uh, innovation in, this, in the Commonwealth, uh, as there has been in New York and certainly in California. Um, but what ends up happening in those states is that companies come in to do the work. They come in yeah. to build the battery uh, plant, uh, to, to build the energy efficiency um, resource, to build a renewable resource. Those companies then start carrying that skill set and that investment opportunity to other places. And the other, the other thing that you want to always have happen is California is doing very well economically. Thank you very much compared to a lot of the rest of the country. So is Massachusetts. Um, and so you not only are doing this innovative stuff, but your economy is thriving. And so you can say to the other states, mm, you might want to think about this. Um, so I applaud what you're doing. It's absolutely the right place to go. The investment opportunities in ESG, energy, social governance are um, huge and meaningful. And, and that's where scale will happen. Both the investment community ch chasing those companies, those companies chasing the Californias of the world and then carrying that to Nevada or Arizona or Colorado and building their businesses around those successes. Thank you, that was great. Thank you. Um, and Amber has joined us. Amber. Hi, Amber. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I was just want to thank Dr. Foy for um, allowing us and hearing us or speaking with us. And so I'm from Corpus Christi. And so my biggest, I'm a second year UEP grad. And so my question for you is due to a lot of disinvested communities, how would you see promoting climate equity? You know, especially when there's not a lot of uh, political capital 
in a lot of these, you know, governances. You know, you speak about small towns and, you know, that's where a lot of the power goes. You know, how do you approach it when, you know, these communities don't necessarily promote that equitable change? Oh, well, that's ultimately a political question. You have to gain political power in those communities. You have to become a voice, you know this, uh, a voice that has to be listened to. Um, I think one of the, the good news and the bad news about the impacts of climate change is you can't, if you're rich, you're not going to be able to escape the impacts. If you're poor, you're not going to be able to escape the impacts. The poor have a much more difficult time dealing with those impacts, and they may be hurt more seriously by it. But rich folks aren't going to be able to just walk away and say, oh, you know, I don't care. I mean, their houses sitting on beachfronts are going to get blown away by hurricanes. Thank you very much. Um, I think that the, the, the most interesting thing going on in the climate movement right now is the young people demanding climate justice. And I think that that's what you're talking about as well. The communities are being impacted in increasingly severe and dangerous ways by the effects of climate change. And that that is unjust. It's not just an environmental problem. It is a human problem. It's a humanities problem. It's a justice problem. It's an equity problem. And I think that having that, that conversation is is being infused into the climate conversation now. And I think it's incredibly important. Um, and I, I don't have an answer for you in Corpus Christi, but, but I do believe that your generation is going to demand that justice. And that's where you become incredibly important. I a follow up. Thank you, Amber. Um, Cause you queued up another question, which is Bob Fishman asked, um, Doug, you might mention the importance of doing the hard work of building political power. For example, the work of ELM Action Fund. Yes, <laughs> way to go, Bob. Um, so there are uh, advocacy and uh, activist organizations out there. I'm on the, Bob and I are both on the board of the Environmental League of Massachusetts, um, which is a lobbying and political campaign um, organization focused on environment generally, but climate change in particular and energy and wind, um, headed by a spectacular leader, um, Elizabeth Henry. Um, and that is a group that's based in Massachusetts, focuses only on Massachusetts. Um, and earlier in our discussion, um, Tina, about things you can do at the local level, one of the things that ELM has been working on is getting people elected to the electric uh, light boards in their communities. Yeah, getting new people on the light boards, which are this sort of old calcified. You know, we've done this for a hundred years, running a little electric power plant in Concord, and all of a sudden, people are saying, "No, no, no, we want to wake up." Um, and and so there's all these opportunities, and groups like ELM are critically important players as they're part of the advocacy function uh, that we talked about, the four sectors. So. Um, Bob's right to point out that everybody should be supporting ELM. That's a my that's our little pitch today, um, because of Massachusetts, uh, they are a major player in moving the climate agenda. Thank you. Um, another question from Eric Drazen: Do you think that we will need to expand carbon offsets through forestation? I'm going to add or other things as we develop alternative energy sources because it will be difficult to meet our needs entirely through clean energy. And I, I'm going to add on to that: it, um, How can you use carbon offsets to maybe create more equity or re re reverse some of the? Um, injustices that Amber had mentioned earlier? Uh, well, it's a great question. Um, this is Erica Drazen who asked this question. Eric's, Eric's, A-R-I-C-S. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, yes, I think uh, offsets have been an interesting challenge to date because they require a, a lot of monitoring and measurement and verification that the thing that you're claiming is offsetting your emission is actually happening and is durable and is producing the offset results. So, uh, but yes, there's no doubt that um, uh, carbon trading, um, a, a carbon market, uh, carbon offsets are powerful 
could be a very powerful international tool for accomplishing, for instance, the airline industry, there's no way they're going to eliminate all their carbon emissions unless they go to something like hydrogen. And I'm not sure that that's happening anytime soon. So they're going to have to use offsets to get to neutrality. Those, that money can help support precisely the kind of communities that Amber was talking about earlier, or the inner city communities that need their buildings repaired. Um, you get huge carbon benefits out of that, and someone else's money pays for it um, because they need the offset. Um, so the market makes sense. Uh, the irony of it is that it was originally sort of a Republican idea, conservative heritage foundation idea to do carbon markets and blah, blah, blah. And then they decided that they didn't like climate change. <laughs> and so they decided they didn't want to do offsets. My guess is we're going to come back around um, internationally because it is the most efficient way to spend money. Um, if, if you've got a, an air, if you're Delta Airlines, you're going to have a lot of money. You're going to have to spend either trying to design a whole new technology, which may not succeed, or buy someone else's forests or someone else's energy efficiency. And I'm all in favor of seeing the market embrace that approach. So yes, it will have to be part of the future. Wonderful. Um, there's more questions and I have more questions, but at 12, at this time, um, we are going to, um, oh, actually, it looks like I can ask one more question. Good. Um, carbon capture and sequestration. sequestration. Ah, um, yeah. uh, Benita S. is asking um, you to speak about carbon capture and sequestration and its scalability. Well, the three things that have been have acknowledged about how we address climate change is first, it was mitigation. Everything was, let's mitigate it. Let's reduce the emissions. Let's stay below one and a half degrees Celsius, the whole, the whole conversation around mitigation. And that's where things like energy efficiency and renewables and others come back in because they reduce the emissions. Now we're talking about adaptation and resiliency because we're getting the effects, even if we stop using fossil fuels next week, we're going to have these effects and they're going to be lasting for a generation. So we have to learn how to adapt. We have to build more resilient places. We have to adjust. And then the, the final piece of that conversation is geoengineering, either sequestration. Can we capture the carbon and store it and keep take it out of circulation? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of all the uh, talk recently in the engineering that's going into using structural wood for um, uh, tall buildings. Yeah, because it fixes the carbon, and steel is a huge source of carbon emissions. And if we can use uh, uh, laminated wood, I gather it has a very big carbon benefit, and you know it sticks the carbon in that wood in the building for a hundred years. So thank you very much. Um, the, so sequestration and, and carbon capture is going to be critical. The one that is still no one knows what the, uh, where we're headed is even bigger geoengineering stuff. Are we going to get to the point that we're going to have to try to reduce solar radiation somehow, blanketing? That makes me really nervous, but there are people talking about it now. And, uh, and if things get really bad um, in terms of the temperature and thermal impacts and fires and droughts and all the things that look like we may be facing you may have to talk about even bigger geoengineering solutions. I don't know what they are. I hope we don't have to go there, um, but it is part of the conversation now. Yeah, well, I wanna thank you. I have so many more questions. Everybody has so many more questions, um, but it's been really helpful. And I think, you know, one of my take home messages from this conversation um, is, you know, the private industry can make a huge difference, you know, and us as consumers and also as um, students that are going to go into like careers, that's a great way to make a difference is if you you're in a private industry, then you can help make these changes. But also, if you're not interested in that, you could be in a supportive uh, role by being in the government, like whether it's local or state or national government helping to make the, the playing field um, easier and more con co uh, better for the companies to work in. Is that is that right. a good takeaway? <laughs> I, I, I think it's a great takeaway. And I think that, uh, you know, it is an all hands on deck challenge. Everyone has a role that they can play if they care about this, whether it is their, their own personal choices, their, their career choices, 
their community choices. Um, and there, there is, you can, you can have a beneficial effect on, on climate change, regardless of where you're located and regardless of what your talent bank is, um, by focusing on the things you can do well. Um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.